create through listening to the Dharma. May I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. So just letting that motivation revive and reconnect. Okay. So for some of you, that last meditation was kind of dropping you in the deep end. And for some of you, those were familiar concepts, but maybe less often actually get to sit with them. So we'll unpack each one. Don't worry. I'm not just going to kind of throw those quite provocative concepts and then run away and leave you with them. So we'll go through them and then we can kind of flesh them out and talk about what resonates and what is um, kind of difficult to swallow. And uh, so don't worry, we'll go into those. But uh, before we do, I thought to just go through the, the questions that were in the chat during the break. So the first one was, uh, you talked about picking an intention for the day. Can you expand that a bit? And, um, you know, picking an intention for the meditation or the day or every moment Basically what you're wanting to do is say something short and sweet and powerful to yourself that recalibrates you. Yeah, that brings you back to yourself, that brings you back to your purpose and your meaning and you know, kind of helps you reorient so that your day is in alignment with your priorities. So, you know, we might say all of us probably, world peace is good, <laughs> you know, something really like pervasively true, right? World peace would be good. And then in our workplace, we are a drama queen and starting all sorts of conflict and not letting go of grudges and stirring the pot and being gossipy or divisive or any number of things if we're feeling a bit grumpy or unsettled that day. So our priority is world peace, but we're creating chaos and warlike situation just in our everyday life. So it's against what we believe. And so setting your intention is a way of kind of launching yourself with a clear mind and open heart with what you actually resonate with. And then you come back to it again and again. So it becomes your default mode rather than what our normal default mode is, which is distraction with a whiff of selfishness, right? So, um, you know, our classic motivation is refuge in bodhicitta. So first thing you wake up in the morning, all cozy in bed, all snuggly under the covers, you think the purpose of my life is to benefit all sentient beings. In order to do that, I must become enlightened. And up you get. <laughs> right and brush your teeth and say it again and take a shower and say it again and then you get to your meditation cushion it's quite awake and alive by then so um it's something that you set but you have to keep resetting and resetting um so that it becomes much more your habit uh the second question was uh would a lot of the unhelpful habits we have also have a psychological basis which overcomes our good mental intentions. How can we help ourselves override these bodily habits, please? Well, I guess the question is, what do you mean by psychological basis as opposed to mental intentions? And I'm, I'm guessing the person is talking about like the psychology idea of the subconscious or maybe influences and drives that we're not as aware of things that kind of rumble under the surface and dictate a lot of our choices, but not always in our surface awareness. So from a Buddhist perspective, we might call those imprints, karmic imprints or karmic habituation related to causally concordant behavioral results, which I'll go into later today. But basically what you want to do is keep coming back to your good mental intention. And by doing that, you bring it to the surface. So whatever the bubbling under the surface drives are, they get overridden by making your priorities prominent again and again. It has to be delicately done because if you're kind of suppressing or denying or depriving yourself of various bodily habits that soothe you, if you trigger that within you, 
then what will happen is you'll build kind of an inner resentment towards your practice. And you'll either become kind of hard and defensive about your practice or rebellious against your own choices. You know, who are you rebelling against? You're rebelling against your own self. But that's what can happen if you're too harsh with yourself in trying to adjust your habits into something more healthy. A better approach, I think, both from a Buddhist perspective and a, you know, kind of secular or psychological perspective is to think, how about I fill up my mind and fill up my life with things that are healthy and good and positive so that there's no room or no tendency to go for the negative, right? You know how when people give up smoking, for example, they sometimes start overeating or chewing gum or some other habit replaces it. And that's what happens if we just kind of pull out the thing that soothed us instead of filling up with things that are healthy, then the unhealthy things kind of just fall off. So filling up, filling up with all of the positive things, then the negative things don't have so much room to stick. You know, that's a quick explanation to a very long-term lifelong process that we all have to look at, but it's something to consider. Rather than telling myself what I can't do, why don't I shift to filling up with all of the things I want to and can do? Fill up. Um, and then the last one was, would a lot of the unhelpful habits we have... Oh, that was a follow-up. Hmm. I, I pressed copy, paste three times in a row. That's what happened. I have to go back to looking at the chat. Let's see. Excuse me. I was so organized and then I wasn't organized at all. All right, ah, here's the one I was looking for. Um, in the chat, it says, I mix up when I think about the karma and emptiness of one's own self. If it is not who, do it, uh, whose responsibility is it if not ourself? Right, karma and emptiness, discuss. That is a very good question. Yes, so that is the essence of this teaching. Basically, there's a self that does exist and there's a self that doesn't exist. And we don't really know either one of them, <laughs> right? Uh, so the self that does not exist at all is the inherently existent self. There's no inherently existent self, not at all, not even conventionally, not even relatively. And we've never really noticed that that's who we identify with, this pretender this sense of self-directed, self-creating person. That one doesn't exist at all. What does exist is the mere I, which is labeled on the collection of aggregates. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. But relatively speaking, there is a continuity of consciousness. It's just not inherently existent, right? So it can exist relatively without inherently existing. That's the whole issue, right? So this continuum of consciousness is created by previous moments of consciousness, which is why there's a continuity. And it's that continuity of consciousness that we plant the karmic seeds onto. Yeah, that's where they're sort of, quote, planted and are carried by and carried with. It's, it's very useful to think of the mental continuum like a river, changing moment to moment, but there's a continuum and maybe it passes from one country to another, it might change a name, just like we pass from one life to another, we might change a name, but it's still the con same continuity. And it might carry <laughs> the same debris from country to country or from life to life. So if that's a kind of a rough way of getting to understand that side. Um, and I think there was one more question in the chat. Um, someone is asking, should I purposely experience pain or increase pain to ensure negative karma is fully ripened? For example, I have a health issue and the only way out of it is either taking a painkiller or doing it naturally. Should I purposely choose natural and endure more pain? Um, no. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, but it's a really good question because sometimes we do think that, that like if I take painkillers, then I'm just um, keeping my bad karma. If you have the karma for a painkiller to work, that's a good karma, right? So you have negative karma ripening as suffering, but then you have positive karma ripening as pain relief. You have so much negative karma and so much positive karma to kind of get too specific about let's exhaust this one and then this one, you know, in this kind of um, one by one way. Time is beginningless. And so you're never going to get to the bottom of the heap that way. A better, a better strategy is to say, how can I change my attitude towards physical pain? in such a way where I'm seeing this body as like a car that needs to take me somewhere and the muffler's busted and the alternator's out and there's just a few pieces that aren't working well. Can I get them to work better? Then do. If I can't, then let's see if I can make peace with it. You know, so you're kind of in this always trying to do the best you can to get things to function as well as they can. But then when you get to that point where that's as good as it gets, you use lojong and mind training to make some peace with it. And part of the way you make peace with it is knowing that you're finishing those old karmas, they're being exhausted, they're going. But a much more efficient way to burn all your negative karma is to purify and if you realize emptiness. So to purify and to realize emptiness requires a certain amount of calm in the mind. Right? To study, you need to be a little bit settled. To meditate, you need to be a little bit settled, which means you might need to take some disprin or some aspirin, right? Because the pain might be too overpowering for you to progress. So if you can take something to soothe it, do so. Um, so we don't want to chase pain. It's more like if pain is inevitable, we might as well use it. But if it's not inevitable, let's get rid of it. It's just such a delicate dance, isn't it? Because how do you know you've tried enough, enough to let go? Yeah, and that's such a personal choice and a day-to-day -day choice. Yeah. And Yuntan, there was another question in the chat earlier, which was um, maybe unrelated, but can you tell me how do I navigate through feelings of jealousy? Yes. Um, well, jealousy certainly, um, creates a negative karmic pattern of comparison and it you know makes you always feel like you don't have enough or you're not good enough or resentment so it's one of those things that even within one life even with one within one day if instead of trying to challenge the, the idea of who you're jealous of and trying to justify or unravel that kind of put it to, to the side for a second and look at how jealousy hurts you. Yeah, when you have jealousy, what does it do to you? And sometimes you kind of have a light bulb moment of how much your own peace has been ruined by this kind of comparison. And it's a false comparison because if you had the same life and resources and et cetera, et cetera, as this person, you would have wound out a similar way but there's no one better or worse than you. We all have Buddha nature equally, you know, nobody's Buddha nature is better than anyone else's Buddha nature. And someone with more status, more reputation, more friends, more beauty, more health, more resources, more whatever, might not actually be getting to enlightenment any quicker than you, that actually might be things that distract them. So you look at the disadvantages of jealousy to you, you look at how jealousy lies to you, and then you try and develop some compassion for the person. The direct antidote to jealousy is rejoicing, which is like the opposite of what you want to do with someone that you're jealous, but it can be so useful. So you think, what is wonderful about them? <laughs> yeah. Look at their beautiful marriage, look at their kind parental skills, look at their well-kept garden, you know, and you consciously rejoice in all of the things you can think of about them. And it can help rob your jealousy of fuel. Yeah, um, it's, it's a controversial exercise, but it takes your whole comparison mindset and makes it into something a little bit healthier. 
Do you want to ask a follow-up about that question, whoever asked it? It's a it's a delicate creature, jealousy. There's usually something under it about they don't deserve it, whatever it is that you're jealous of. They don't deserve it. I deserve it. Or why do they always get to, but I never, blah, blah, blah. There's some sort of funny sense of injustice sometimes under jealousy that's worth unpacking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a very useful exercise is, it sounds so cliche, it sounds so American, but it can be so useful, which is to meditate on gratitude. Um, but you can't do it in a cheesy way or a forced way or it won't work. But just kind of a sincere examination of what do I actually want for my life? Do I have what I need? to do that. And you think, okay, what I want for my life is developing the mind and overcoming destructive emotions and being of benefit to others. That's what I want for my life. Do I have what I need to do that? Yep. <laughs> All right. You have enough physical independence. You have enough intelligence and you have enough resources. So you kind of feel filled I think we lost her. We've we've lost General Yinton. I think it was a network network issue. I'm sure she'll be back in a moment. So just hang hang tight. Hopefully the uh, the network comes back immediately for her. Well, for <clears throat> being on a farm in Montana, she's the connections were really Yeah. I noticed it was um, this morning there were the, the bars were not green, they were yellow sometimes, but the connection was still clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was another um, question in the chat. Is there nothing like innocence in Buddhist views? I have a hard time accepting cruelty towards children and animals according to previous ex existence as karma. Oh, here, here comes Venerable Yen. Hey, I'm back. Sorry, hey, my internet hooray. just dropped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Internet dropped. But yeah, the innocence question, that's a good one. Um, did you guys have some questions while I was um, No, we were off? just being patient and I, I, I started to... to I start by asking that, you know, repeating the question from the chat. That's all. So, yeah, yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. I don't know what's going on in Montana. Maybe everyone's turned on their Netflix and it's killing all the <laughs> bandwidth. <laughs> but um, Saturday afternoon, it's time for a Disney movie. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, no, the question of innocence always comes up with the karma conversation. Like, for example, children, you know, who haven't done anything in their life, horrible things happening to them then our mind goes, karma sounds like it's saying that that little deserves bad things. And it's a I think we're, we're not uh, picking you up. Then about you on 10. We lost your audio. If the bandwidth is low, um, maybe she should turn off um, the video. <sighs> Her video is off, so let's just um, take a breath.
Yeah, we've lost Werner Williamson again. Um, and uh, yes, Nina, this is a very troubling story. And um, karma, karma does it, it. I mean, although it it's horrible what happens to all of us, and and particularly to children that are innocent, and and they really don't have any choice, you know, because they're they're so dependent. Um, you know, don't have choice to, to go live elsewhere when really horrible things happen. Here comes Venom Engine again. Hello. Hey, there we go. Yeah. Now the now the Zoom just booted me off, so I don't know what the deal is there. But um, if you can make me uh, co-host again, yeah, so I have done so. Yeah. Great. Great. Sorry, folks, I don't know what's going on with the internet, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to this innocence question. Basically, the idea is that, you know, mind is beginningless. So of course, no child ever deserves anything to happen to them. No one ever deserves. We don't have that word. It's not a punishment. Karma just means cause and effect. So at some point in a past life, they created the cause. And remember that karma magnifies. So it might be that they did a very minor form of something of that energy. And because it expands like a seed, then in the lifetime when they met a perpetrator, something terrible happened. But it's still the responsibility of the perpetrator to not do that, right? And that's where all of the responsibility lies is on the perpetrator. And, you know, we need to really look at that from a common sense, you know, psychological perspective. It's just internally, once you're an adult, you think, if something terrible happened to me, it should not have happened. They were wrong. And they would have done that to someone else, if I hadn't created the cause for it. So the reason I'm the one that experienced it, is because somewhere in my past lives, I planted the seed for that. Yeah. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but it can also be an empowering thing. It, part of you can even think better me than someone else. You know, if this perpetrator had that horrible habit of doing destructive things, it would have happened to someone else if they hadn't met me in my karma. So I'm lucky enough to have a spiritual path and a framework to work through it. And I wish it hadn't happened, but I can make it useful. Maybe someone else it would have destroyed because they didn't have the same support structure as me. It, it's a delicate thing. So it's not the sort of thing that you would ever tell a kid or tell parents of a child who has had something horrible happen. You know, this is a conversation for card carrying Buddhists who are hardcore about their own mental development. Yeah, it's something for you to talk to yourself about of if this horrible thing happened, what is there any tiny whiff, shadow, echo of that behavior still in me? Because that's my project to work on. And if it's not, if it's gone, well, that's a legacy from one of my past lives. And thank goodness I've developed out of it. But that doesn't mean I was never that. Yeah. So, so karma explains, but does not justify. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. And I think an explanation is better than thinking that things just happen randomly, because exactly. then it gives us a chance to, 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 to own it and to take control, you know, in the of our future anyway. Exactly. And I mean, I'm sure that we all have this experience of maybe you have four different jobs in a row and four different bosses, but somehow you have similar issues with the authority figures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and psychologically, you know, there's reasons. Historically, you know, there's reasons, but also karmically, <laughs> you know. For example, I, I know that I was a very uptight bureaucrat at some point because I always have trouble at air, airports, right? They always go through all of my visas and they're like, why were you in Malaysia in 2003? And, you know, they go through a whole thing. Always, you know, and then my friend with the same kind of passport, they're like, yep, go on. You know, so I, I take that as an invitation to not be uptight about things that don't matter and to try not to be a bureaucrat. You know, like I take that as an invitation to examine, is there any of that kind of uptight school marm energy still in me? And hopefully not, I really try and work on it, but it might be. And so, you know, that's a useful project. 
and of course many other you know horrible things too but that's kind of a useful daily life one of I can feel myself get uptight about something and then no that creates the cause for a whole set of unfortunate communication dynamics I don't want in my life no one wants in their life shut up <laughs> you know for example Okay, so um, so we'll go into some of these details of karma and just see what you think. So I'll go back through the things that we looked at in the meditation and, um, and then I'll turn the PowerPoint off again and you can ask me if there were parts that you were stuck on. Um, so Dave, if you can uh, make me able to screen share, I have lost the ability. says no. Oh, here we go. Great. Okay. So y'all see that. Okay. So these are the points that were in the meditation. And these are all points directly from the Lam Rim Chenmo, the great treatise on the stages of the path to enlightenment by Lama Tsongkhapa, which is kind of our Galukpa seminal text that summarizes and brings together all of the main points of the Buddha. So karma is definite, karma increases, karma is personal, karma doesn't go to waste. Okay, let's unpack these. So first of all, karma is an extremely hidden phenomena. Okay, it's extremely hidden. As opposed to manifest phenomena, like the water in my glass that appears to my eye primary consciousness observing it in front of me basically like opposed to obvious things. Karma is not just a regularly hidden phenomena, it's extremely hidden. And so these are technical categories that you'll find and you can ask Eshela to unpack them for you if you ever want a class on those. But a hidden phenomena is something like the emptiness of an inherently existent self that appears to the mental consciousness of an Arya Bodhisattva in single pointed equipoise on emptiness. So a hidden phenomena is emptiness, for example. And it's something that can be accessed through valid cognition and in particular valid cognition, analyzing the ultimate, blah, blah, blah. Karma is more subtle than emptiness. That's what I want us to hear. Karma is more subtle than emptiness, which means it's gonna take a lot longer for us to prove it to ourselves experientially all of the details and nuances. So then you ask yourself, what do you do in the meantime, if it's not something I can prove immediately, or prove gradually within this life, it's something that's really going to take a long time to prove experientially. What you do is you look at the fact that the Buddha was a valid being. So we rely on our observations of the natural world and our reliance on the Buddha as being a valid being, and therefore his teachings on karma are undeceptive. So the natural world cause and effect plays out, right? Kind of the way biology plays out, meaning that things don't pop out of nowhere unrelated. Anything that is a result or an effect has a cause, and that cause is of a similar type to the effect. For example, apple seed, apple tree, right? The classic example. Wooden table, substantial cause, wood, right? Coactive conditions, carpenter, you know, screws, assembly line, whatever, you know? So what we're talking about is we see in the natural world the way cause and effect plays out in a related, organized way. We can prove it with science. We take that as an example for why that's probably true in the mental sphere as well. That's one way to kind of get yourself in the mood to operate under the influence of the teachings of karma. The other is to think, why would the Buddha lie to me about this? He hasn't lied to me about anything else that I have been able to prove. Like if I meditate on patience and loving kindness, I have less anger. I can prove that to myself today, you know, that's something that resonates. There's, it's got the ring of truth to it. This and this and this that I can prove experientially. So it stands to reason that if the Buddha is teaching these things about karma, that they're undeceptive. 
So you take it as Venerable Rabina would say, take it as your working hypothesis or your working theory. And the other piece I would add is to ask yourself, if I live according to the laws of karma, will I live an ethical and kind altruistic life? Will I, you know, be a good citizen? Will I be a good neighbor, a good family member, a good coworker? Someone who's of benefit and doesn't harm. Yes. So living in this way leads to a healthy life. This is another way to kind of get yourself in the mood to believe these things, but you don't want to force it. You just kind of want to go, huh, the Buddha says this, there's some sense to that. There's things about that I can't quite prove yet, but I'm willing to operate under that assumption because it's beneficial to do so. And there's enough logic. Okay. So <clears throat> the first one that karma is definite, or this refers to the certainty of karma. This is the basic thing that most people know about karma, which is that negative actions are the cause of suffering and positive actions are the cause of happiness. Yeah, the substantial causes, the main causes. So when you look at that very basic, simple thing that we've heard about karma, how does it sound? Does it have the ring of truth? Or when we were meditating on it, did you have some interesting little insights or qualms, um, arguments come up? Does it feel true or true enough to live by? Or do you have a little niggling doubt? Karma is certain. Go ahead, Emily. David, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought you um, had a story about when the monks were leaving um, Tibet, um, they were attacked by Chinese soldiers. And some passing, like, how, doesn't that make you feel bad? And he said, well, it's, it's karma. So how can karma be neutral and yet be good or bad? I, if that makes sense. Well, a karmic seed before it blossoms into anything is neutral, the seed itself. The mind that created it wasn't, unless you, you're creating neutral karma, but you know, neutral karma is not as interesting to talk about. It creates, you know, neutral feeling, but you know, positive and negative karma were created through positive or negative actions, plants a seed on your mental continuum. While it's a potency, while it's just a little could happen someday kind of thing, it's neutral while it's in that stage. Think like a literal seed, but then when it's sprinkled, when conditions come, water and sunshine and whatever, in our case, states of mind like anger, attachment, or love and compassion, plus external conditions, when those conditions ripen it, then it's no longer neutral. So it's just kind of while it's sleeping there, <laughs> while it's latent, it's a neutral phenomena, but before and after it, it wasn't. It's just kind of think of it in terms of it's dormant where it's sleeping until conditions water it into experience. Yeah. And so, you know, in the example of the monks, that's this is a very philosophical way of looking at hardship, isn't it? It's very useful. Instead of going, why are the Chinese doing this? You think, well, we created the cause for the Chinese to do this. So let's not retaliate. Let's just get the heck out of here and try and purify our minds so that this doesn't happen again. It doesn't mean that they were right to do it or that they should be asked to stop. It just means that retaliation is not a useful mindset because it's just gonna create more of the same, right? Yeah. 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 My, my sound was, was not, not very good. I couldn't hear Emily very well, but the, the point of that story was that the monks weren't upset that they were being shot at. Yeah. They, they weren't angry because of that because they felt they, they had created the causes up to, you know, so they weren't blaming the Chinese necessarily. They weren't angry which is kind of amazing. It, it is, it really is. And it, it, changes, it changes all of our suffering to start looking at it in this way of, oh, okay, 
this is what happens when dot 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 you know like this is what happens when i disregard life i get sick you know so when you're sick you think oh this is what happens for not being respectful of life okay well I need to be respectful full of life out of compassion, of course, but I also need to be respectful of life out of self-interest because I don't want to get sick and I don't want to have a premature death. So you've got a reason for others and a reason for self to be more ethical. And it makes you just strategic as opposed to upset. Yeah, I mean, in a perfect world, of course, you know, initially we get grumpy about hardship that makes sense. We're only human. But, you know, the more these teachings take hold, the more they really influence your own relationship to hardship. Yeah, until we can become like those monks who are like, oh, yeah, <laughs> okay, well, here we go. Yeah, it's amazing. I, it was the first thing I ever heard about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, probably the first thing a lot of you heard right? When he was in what Time Magazine, I wasn't, you know, not in 1959, Time Magazine somewhere in the 80s, I don't know. And uh, maybe when he got the Nobel Peace Prize. But all I really understood was that he lost his whole country and he wasn't angry. That's all I knew. That was enough for me to say, I want to be a Buddhist. <laughs> this sounds great, because I lose a toy and I'm angry. <laughs> he lost his whole country. Oh my goodness. You know, it's amazing. So anyway, this shows us the human uh, ability or capacity, I think, that with a well-trained mind, we can get into that kind of mindset. So the second one is that karma increases. So the magnification of karma means from one seed, many branches and fruit. This applies to both positive and negative actions equally. This one, you know, the analogy of a literal seed does help you know, that things kind of gain in potency or that as they sprout, they grow in size. And this always, with all of these, there's a qualification that it grows exponentially unless you cut off the potency for it to do so. So a lot of you will know the reason why we do Vajrasattva practice every night is of course to purify negative karma. But even if we don't do it in a particularly mindful way with the four opponent powers complete, just saying the 21 Vajrasattva mantras stops the ability of karma to multiply. Even if we do it in kind of a half-hearted, distracted way, it at least nips it in the bud. So that's a useful thing. So the fact that karma increases is interesting. We usually just think about the bad, but it's also useful to think of the good, you know, that kind act of sharing as a child, that sweet act of patience as a teenager, those moments of altruism as a young adult, the blah, 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 blah. You know, you just go through your life and you think there was a million little moments where I could have chosen selfishness and I didn't. You know, there's a million little moments where I thought of others and the greater good instead of just today and my little needs, you know, and that's an amazing thing. And it doesn't mean today and your needs don't matter. It means that if you think in the big picture, your day and your needs will be taken care of as a byproduct. So how to just keep stretching the mind open to think of the greater good is really going to have this long-term benefit. This particular fact of karma helps me understand why perhaps terrible things happen to quote, good people. That, you know, someone who is experiencing a lot of hardship and obviously has trained their mind out of harmful behavior, still having really difficult things happen to them. They might have done something very minor in a past life that was never purified and just kept growing and growing and growing like a cancer. And here it is today. So this one is very important because it's related to a misunderstanding many people have, particularly misunderstandings you might have about Tong Len giving and taking practice, but also just kind of general understandings, which is karma is personal. You don't experience the effects of actions that you did not do. You created the cause, then you're the experiencer of the result. So we have a legacy of inheritance from your mental continuum of lives. That's my phrasing. But, you know, we've inherited a lot from our past lives. We're still the recipient of that legacy. 
You can't take someone's karma. You can't give them your karma. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. It's individual. So we're infinitely interconnected mind streams, but we're still individual mind streams, despite being very much connected like a giant net. So when you think about giving and taking practice, Tonglen, it's a mental attitude, isn't it? It's a mental attitude where you think, I want to take on my own suffering, my own future suffering, and the suffering of all sentient beings and give it to my self-cherishing thought. I want to give my future happiness and my present happiness to all sentient beings. This is a way of overcoming self-cherishing that's really powerful. And then maybe you've heard stories of, I think, the 16th Karmapa who did Tonglen so powerfully that he seemed to manifest the illnesses of his students. And you wonder, well, how does that work? And the way it works is that for a very, very strong practitioner with very, very strong karmic connections, we become a powerful condition for people. So we're never a cause, we're a condition. And it's a subtle distinction, but think about the way your mind is influenced by someone who is very, very angry, but not speaking. Yeah, a grumpy person walks into a bus and sits next to you very grumpy. If your mind is in a very protected, altruistic, centered mood, you just think, oh, poor bugger, he's in a bad mood. And you're just like, oh, rough. If you're feeling a bit fragile or a bit unsettled, you could start feeling afraid or feeling annoyed, right? So they're a powerful condition, but they're not a cause. So they're influencing your state of mind, but the way in which they influence your state of mind is very much about you. So you're acknowledging influence, but you're not saying they made you feel any kind of way because that same powerful condition could be something that ripen one seed or another or another. So our teachers can be a very strong condition for us to ripen little seeds of realization that we've planted eons in the past. Maybe you've had this experience with, with your Geshe or with other teachers where just by them teaching it, you almost feel what they mean. And then they leave and you're like, oh, it's gone, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but kind of like while you were with them, you're like, yeah, I get it, I get it, oh man. Yeah, and they're just, they're such a powerful condition to kind of show you things about yourself. But they could only do that if you had created the cause for that, right? Which is why not everyone has the same experience despite the teacher being just as powerful equally, right? So it's an interesting one, this karma is personal thing, but it, it again helps you feel a bit more empowered and, and take a bit more responsibility, I think. Can I can I ask about the, yeah. the, the term group karma? Yeah, yeah, or like collective karma yeah. or, yeah. It's a, it's a good one because there is such a thing as group karma or collective karma, but it's not like you've all merged into a blob. It's that you're all very similar and have done very similar things. And you probably did very similar things at the same time, which is why you're all meeting up again, having similar experiences. And why, you know, different cultures take on certain, you know, generally speaking habits or, you know, cultural norms or societal norms. Why sometimes certain communities will have things happen to them again and again, good or bad. You know, it's, it's that you're similar to each other. And you probably did things together that were similar. It's a similar idea to how we have the parents that we have. You know, some, some new age folks like to think that we pick our parents, right? And we didn't pick our parents at our level, right? If you're an advanced practitioner, you can. But for us, it was just habit energy. We either had positive or negative or mixed, but it was strong habituation with these people right? Really strong habituation. And yes, we're all sort of turning into our parents, but actually we sort of started a little bit like them to begin with, which is why we all wound up together, you know, and probably your parents have been very close to you in many lives. You know, they've been your brothers and sisters and they've been your children and they've been your spouses and they've been your coworkers and you just keep bumping into each other because this group karma, it, it kind of creates a magnetism amongst yourselves. Kind of the more you keep bumping into each other, 
positive or negative, the more you're kind of drawn to each other, which is why it's so powerful to do group practice. And there's even a lot of sutras and Lama Zopa Rinpoche will say as well, that doing a practice in a group is much more powerful than doing it by yourself, the same exact practice. And you can feel it, can't you? The way it lifts into something a little bit bigger, even if you're slightly distracted by, you know, human drama and conflict and things, there's still a powerful impact to doing it together. But it also creates the cause to keep doing it together again and again. So you might find that at Dharma centers, you have more powerful relationships more quickly, good ones and bad ones. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> food for thought. Okay, and the last one is karma doesn't go to waste. So the actions you have done do not perish unless, right? Unless exhausted or experienced, that's one way. Burnt by anger or wrong views. So that renders impotent the positive ones or purified, which renders impotent the negative ones. And the way we purify is through the wisdom realizing emptiness, which we're gonna talk about tomorrow and through the four opponent powers, which maybe some of you already know about. So basically an ultimate truth project and a relative truth project are your good ways to purify. You know, ideally combine them, that's even better. But it's good to know that you can also burn your positive seeds through strong anger. So then you're kind of killing your opportunity for happiness. You destroy them with really strong anger and wrong views. Um, this top one, unless they're exhausted or experienced, this is kind of our day-to-day -day what's happening. You know, day-to-day -day we're having karmas ripen and they're finishing and they ripen and they finish. Good ones and bad ones and good ones and bad ones. But it's just a drop in the ocean because as we experience them, we're also creating new ones. So we're just kind of <laughs> topping up the karma bag in the background. So a more efficient project is to purify if we want to get rid of the baddies. Yeah, so purification those two ways. All right, so as you look at those four, um, do you have any questions before we shift gears? And just unmute yourself and holler. But if you look at those four, do you have any, any questions or any intriguing ideas? Hi. Hey, yeah, go Hi ahead. There. <laughs> so, um, Earlier, um, when you were talking about the, you know, karma is certain, you asked that question, um, you know, is there any doubt, right? I mean, so, you know, I've heard this so many times, you know, the, you know, what is karma, the laws of karma, and I've tried to live by those, you know, my understanding of it, and I mean, for many years, but yet at the, when we were going through the meditation, there was still that little doubt, and I was trying to figure out where is that coming from, right? And I was just, you know, and I even wrote it down afterwards so that I could remember <laughs> what I was, what I had gone through. And I'm, I'm still wondering, where is it coming from that little doubt that little, because I feel like I've been, like I said, practicing for so many years, and I thought I had it down, right? I thought I had, you know, um, my understanding of it and um, my belief in it, right? But there's, for some reason, it popped up a little bit in the background. Yeah. So. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Well, and you don't have to force it. You know, that's the whole thing is, is keep debating with yourself. Like is, is the doubt based on you don't want to change? <laughs> is the doubt based on some experience you have that seems to disprove it? You mm -hmm. know, just kind of like explore it. Don't feel like you need to run over the top of it with words and force yourself to believe something. You know, you have enough of an ethical core to say, I want to live by positive, constructive actions for the welfare of others. Mm -hmm. My assumption is that will lead to happiness. But even if it doesn't, it's a good way to live anyway. Right. You know, you already have that, right? And so then the details of becoming certain about these things, remember, again, it is extremely phenomena. So it's only a Buddha that sees relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. Mm -hmm. right for the, you know up until then they're alternating things so you'll be able to see emptiness directly once you've realized emptiness mm -hmm. but that's only while you're in meditative equipoise 
then you'll come out of meditative equipoise. Things will still appear to be truly existent. You just won't believe it so much. Right. Right. So from that point onward, you'll be purifying loads and loads and loads of negative karma, just huge amounts, which means that more and more of reality will become clear to you and your faith in karma will deepen because you'll go, oh, that's why, you know, some strange little detail. You're like, I have green eyes because this, <laughs> ah, interesting, you know, or I keep seeing this person every lifetime because of this thing, you know, 20 lifetimes ago, ah, mm -hmm. you, you'll see more details as your mind becomes clearer. And the more details you see, the more your faith in it will increase. Mm -hmm. But right now, you know, we, we can only just see this little window of that makes sense. And I kind of see it play out, but I just, you know, I barely remember breakfast. Like, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just hope for the best. Okay. Yeah. But I think understanding the way conditions influence causes is something we can feel in daily life. Like, say you're in kind of a, a bad mood, but not a terrible one. So like you're in a bad mood, but you haven't committed to it yet. You know, you haven't like invested, I believe this bad mood to be true. You're just kind of like, you feel it hovering. Mm. And you've done enough practice that you say to yourself, don't give in, don't give in, don't give in. It's telling you nonsense, this bad mood. And you consciously redirect to positive states of mind, to working for others. And then like 20, 30 minutes goes by and you realize the mood is lifted, mm. you know? And it's, it really is like you had one old karma ripening. You managed it well, it finished. And the next one to ripen was a good one, mm. you know? Rather than a bad one arose, you believed it, you gave into it, you fed it. And now another negative one arose and another and another, and now you have a terrible day, mm -hmm. you know? So we have daily life kind of feelings about that. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, are there any other thoughts about those four? I'll pop them back up just in case you forgot. <laughs> I had alternating feelings of comfort from the good things I've done, but also terror at the, at the back. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and also a feeling of, uh, I have to be very cautious. <laughs> especially if they grow and if they and if they're yeah. never lost you know and um particularly i, I thought you know that I, i'm just putting up with the conditions i'm in I'm, I'm not continually i'm not content with with the situation i'm i'm you know but i just put up with it but you know mm -hmm. there's a chance that i could actually constructively change this if i was deliberate about it and then i wouldn't have to put up with what's going on that, that those are all things that came up in meditation yeah yeah no that's good stuff that's good meaty stuff and you know the thing about the teaching on karma is that like intellectually it's not that hard is it just intellectually you can get your head around these concepts it's much more just experientially you're like the feeling of that how do i really touch the truth of it when it's so hidden you know and so it kind of the light flickers on and off of yeah i get it i feel that oh it's gone again you know, whereas with the wisdom realizing emptiness, intellectually, it can be quite complex and quite difficult to get to the bottom of it. But sometimes if you're just kind of in a simple meditation, you can have some sort of experience, even though it's not a realization yet, even though you don't have direct perception yet, you can kind of feel the truth of it, even though intellectually it's harder. So it's, it's strange, these two topics, karma and emptiness. But um, yeah, just keep keep exploring it and don't feel like you can't have doubts. Hold open the doubts with a background idea of probably what the Buddha says is true. But he also said, don't believe anything I say just because I said it. You know, that's not who we are as Buddhists, right? We're not fundamentalists. You don't have to believe anything you don't want to believe. It's just you have this kind of assumption of probably true. <laughs> you know, he hasn't lied to me so far. Yeah. So we've got results of karma, which I think you guys have a sense of. We'll do a, a meditation on this soon. Um, but basically, once you've created a complete karma, you know, you have intention, you do it, you're happy about it, you've done the thing, here are the results of a, a karma of that strength. So the ripening result is the body and mind we will take in a future life. The causally concordant result is our area of practice. 
for the most part. I mean, all of it is, but this one is really key. So the experiential one is that we'll experience a situation similar to the one our actions caused others to experience, you know, good and bad. Behavioral is that we will tend to do that action again in the future. We'll have the habit of it, right? And then the environmental result is our experience of the environment and climate where we live or the household that we're in or the country that we're in. It's um, kind of the, the external experience. So this behavioral result is key because what is it that we're gonna take with us to our future lives? Yeah, what we're gonna take with us to our future lives is habits, basically. Yeah, habits. And some of them are really useful and some of them aren't. So hopefully we'll develop our mind to such an extent that we have a realization of bodhicitta, of renunciation, of the wisdom realizing emptiness. But if we don't, still we'll carry a lot of, you know, what we've been up to this life. So do we have this tendency to have the wrong attitude about doing the right thing? For example, like I'm doing the right thing to be a good person or to get validation or to get some sort of status or, you know, you're doing the right thing for the wrong reason then you'll either have a habit of being a manipulative person or a habit of hypocrisy or a habit of not liking virtue genuinely. So it's better you enjoy it, right? <laughs> so that you have the association of enjoying it. You know, if you think of your practice as a chore that you force yourself to do, then you'll have cushion aversion in your next life. You'll think I'm drawn to that meditation, but I'm also afraid of it and I don't like it. And I don't know why, because I've never done it before in this life, but uh, you know, you'll have this kind of relationship with it. So, you know, just look at your attitude toward your practice. Your reason for your practice is as important as your practice. Yeah. And the attitudes that you bring to it. So the meditation that we're gonna do, and I'll have a little break so you guys can stretch and um, go to the loo if you need to, but the meditation we're gonna do is on the 10 non-virtues and their environmental results and their causally concordant results, just to kind of look at how they play out in our daily life. So we got our classics, right? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct for physical, lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle talk for speech and then covetousness, malice, ill will for mind. And this whole, you know, this chart, if you're interested, I can send it to David and he can forward it to you guys. But um, basically you're looking at, here's the experiential result. Here's the environmental result. Do I have these? <laughs> yeah, and you're just to see, am I creating more of the same of things that I don't want? And the reason for doing this kind of analysis is not to feel bad, right? The reason to do this is transformation is fueled by self-awareness, right? So the more self-awareness you have about your negative habits, the more you'll catch yourself. And having an environmental cue can help that. You know, how many of you old Dharma students, when you're on a, a rocky road with many crevasses and lots of mud, think, oh, divisive speech. Yep, got to work on that because it's an environmental result. So, you know, anyway, so that's the meditation that we're going to do after the break. It'll be kind of an interesting check in and um, then we'll call it a day. So five minute break. Great. See you soon. Um, hi, sorry to interrupt. I'm actually, uh, I'm in India and right now it's 12 a.m. and I'm feeling very sleepy. Um, this recording will be available at uh, where exactly if I want to rewatch it? Um, okay, I'll speak on that, Dave. Hello, this is Aruna, so I'm director. Um, Dave, I, I think just stepped away. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when we'll post it, um, but it will be posted uh, on our website or to our uh, YouTube uh, uh, channel uh, in the near future. 
Um, we're, we're volunteers at Lama Yeshiling, so we do our best to get things uh, up and posted as quickly as we can, but uh, in the near future. So thank, thank you for asking. Actually, um, if I may any, say, it, Thank you, Manosha, yes. Yeah, it, it will, it's on, it'll be on Facebook, the Lama Yeshiling Facebook page right away. Um, and then it will also be, it will be on YouTube. Uh, okay, okay. Page. okay, okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, and, and thank you for joining us and staying up so late and uh, hanging out and being with our community. So it's really nice to know you. No, this, this has been really, really wonderful um, an explanation of everything in detail. And I, I really feel... Um, very good about it attending attending this and having the opportunity to attend this mm -hmm. i just slept through um, i think from last 15 minutes and i didn't realize ah. but i am <laughs> trying to yeah so um I, i'm just not able to force myself to be up anymore um but yeah i am looking forward to the recording um and thank you very much thank you thanks a lot Okay, and you take care. Thank you. Thank you too. Bye. Yeah, it's twelve thirty. It's it's um it's midnight in India. Okay, everybody back, I think. Yep. Great. So back into good posture. <clears throat> and uh, however you're able to be straight with your spine, even if it means lying down, just really try and get that nice, even, easy flow of energy. and just settle. Releasing any tension that might have gathered. Allowing the facial muscles to relax, the jaw to unclench. the shoulders to drop into their natural position. A strong back, a soft front. not clenching or holding in your stomach, 
Just let it be very soft. And relax down through your hips and legs. Imagining that any tension is leaving out through your toes, dissolving into space. And back to the breath. Imagining that everything that has come before is just settling and digesting in the background. No need to interfere with it. Just staying very simple and direct on your breath. If you're a bit anxious, you can move your awareness to your stomach where it rises and falls. Or if you're a bit sleepy, watch where the air enters and exits the nostrils. But you're just picking one simple location of your breathing, settling there. If you get lost in thought, gently disengage, come back to the breath. and revive your motivation. Bodhicitta for the welfare of all sentient beings. Refuge 
inner and outer. Just touch back into your motivation. And now we shift to analysis and there will be things on the screen, but you don't need to look at them. They're just a reference if you get distracted. Start by thinking about the action of killing, taking life, disregarding life. One of the results is a short life and poor health. So we ask ourselves, do we have poor health? Of course, there are many conditions that contribute to poor health. But we also know many people who eat nothing but junk food and never exercise and are still somehow incredibly healthy. And we know people who eat perfectly, only organic, perfectly vegetarian, exercise all the time, and still somehow have ill health. So even though diet and exercise are important conditions, they're not the substantial cause of health. Protecting life is. So just looking at your own relationship with life, little insects, pets, even people. If we're in a place with strife and war or where food and drink aren't healthy or medicine is not potent or doesn't work for us, this is all from killing karma. So just see if you can relate any of that to your personal experience. And then think about your relationship with stealing or taking what hasn't been freely offered or taking for granted the possessions of others or not returning what you've borrowed or thinking if no one notices or it's a victimless crime that somehow it's not stealing. Maybe certain things from the internet, maybe supplies from work, maybe misuse of family goods. But just look at your own relationship to stealing with some objectivity, not going into a shame spiral, but just very honest. From stealing, we have poverty, or our things are stolen, or we have trouble using them, they break. We might live in a poor place with many dangers, droughts, floods, poor harvests, natural disasters, forest fires.
So make it very personal. Is there a habit of this still within my mental continuum? And if so, what does it look like? And then checking in with our own pattern of sexual misconduct, unwise or unkind sexual behavior, betrayal. This results in disagreeable or unfaithful spouse, disharmony in the marriage, living in a dirty place with poor sanitation, bad odors and misery or just a general lack of trust. Again, with objectivity, without falling into a story, take an honest look. And we shift from physical actions that create negative karma to verbal actions. Looking at our own tendency of lying with intentional deception or divisiveness may be true, but is meant to split. How do we use our speech that might not be ideal? and still investigating speech, are there habits of harshness? It might be true, but it's not kind. Or idleness, it might be kind, but it's unnecessary or frivolous. Gossipy maybe. Just take a really general look at your speech in an ordinary day, what seems positive and worth keeping and what might be negative and worth working on. Because all of this speech leads to receiving similar things. And with negative speech, the environment is difficult to navigate. can be dangerous.
and shifting from speech to mind. The main negativities of mind boil down to covetousness, malice and wrong views related to attachment, anger and ignorance. What habits within the mind that are negative do we actually nourish, that we actually feed and keep going? Not just the arisal of them, but the giving in, which creates a habit of more of the same and the experience of it. And if you were to make a guess, which one of those three is most common for you as an individual? Is it covetousness and strong desire? Is it malice, ill will, anger, irritability and annoyance? Or is it wrong views, a fog of confusion, a series of superstitions and conspiracies? Do you have a dominant one? And so think to yourself, through seeing these patterns in myself more clearly, may I interrupt their momentum. May I prevent them as much as I can. And in this way, not harming myself, not harming others, and actually moving towards the fulfillment of my potential. and dedicating. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May the precious view of emptiness that has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. And you can relax your attention. Okay. So thanks everyone. And um, I'll see you tomorrow for a bit of emptiness and have a nice night. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. That's wonderful. Guys.